you are probably wondering why I brought you all here this evening to this deserted place and uh, in this foul weather. Well, it's because we have business to attend to. We're going to be talking about macro lenses. But Alan, it's video month, macro video month. How can we possibly be talking about macro lenses? <coughs> Excuse me. Well, we are. I have made an executive decision, uh, several executive decisions, and here they are. Uh, I am going to postpone, no, not postpone, elongate the uh, video competition. In fact, I'm going to elongate the month. I decided that January was, first of all, a bad month to do video and uh, a short month. So I decided to add another month to it. So the video competition is actually January and February. There is no photo competition in January or any competition. I'm taking the month off. So are you. So you have an extra three weeks or whatever February is this year. I think it's a leap week of some kind. So you get uh, until the end of February to turn in your video. If you have already turned in the video, that's fine. It counts. If, you, uh, if you've turned it in and wish you hadn't, that's too bad. <laughs> it counts. So uh, that's what we're doing, which means I can take... A couple of days off the video stuff to talk about some important things to do with uh, lenses. I've been getting a lot of questions lately from people who are new to, uh, to macro who want to know things like what exactly is a, a macro lens? How is it different than, than what we're already you know using um, in photography? I mean everybody's got some kind of an idea what their, what their uh, photographic lenses do uh, but the, the whole concept of what is different about macro lenses confuses some people. It confuses me sometimes. Look at these. We have got so many lovely examples here uh, to talk about. I thought, well, what, that's what we'll do. We'll talk a little bit about what makes a macro lens a macro lens as opposed to just another camera lens. What's inside one of these things that makes it so expensive <laughs> and oftentimes the, the, the uh, jewel in the, uh, the lens uh, manufacturer's crown and uh, you know, why, why they are uh, so, so special and uh, why we love them so much. So I'm going to talk about that. I'm also going to talk about the difference in focal length. Uh, when it comes to macro lenses and why that's important. Why there is a difference between, say, 15 millimeters and 200 millimeters. Exactly what does that mean? So this is, this is a, a, a primer, if you will, for, for new folks uh, who, are, who are getting started on their macro journey or people who may have been around a while but just haven't really felt like asking somebody what uh, what's going on with macro lenses so it's going to be a review for most of you and it'll probably be boring as heck for some of the the more uh, advanced amongst you but um, yeah sometimes we need to just pause and, and, and get back to the basics and talk about what's inside these things and there are some cool things in these lenses that you don't find in other lenses so I'm going to be talking about all of that um, the, uh, the, the change of plans, uh, that, that pretty much sums it up, really. I'm just adding the month. There won't be a photo competition in February. It will be the, the video. So that gives you time now to think about what you can do, a little bit of time to practice, and, and maybe get something put together. Hopefully that'll, that'll work. Um, this week is going to be so busy. I don't know if you got to see the splash screen at the beginning uh, showing some of the covers for this week. On Thursday, I am revisiting the R1C one. Look at this thing. That's, that's no pocket camera. <laughs> 
<laughs> what a what a combination this is the uh, the Z8 with the um, R1C1 and the MC105, uh, we'll, which we'll be talking about this evening. I decided um, th this is what happened with the R1C1. I, I got a little bit of flack from uh, R1C1 lovers and and Nikon uh, creative lighting uh, stuff fans who thought that I didn't do a very good job of covering it in the review that I did back in the summer. And I'll be the first to admit that it could have been better. But when I went back, uh, and I decided that what I'd do was just uh, I'd do another video, I'd do another review uh, and, and be a little bit more uh, careful about uh, what I said and how I compared it to, to other things. But you know, I went back I looked, looked at the video and I have spent two days working with the R1C1 testing it and I, I decided that there is relatively little that I'm going to change but quite a bit I'm going to reinforce. So I've decided that rather than make a video of this which uh, it kind of uh, it takes away the opportunity for you guys to fight back I'm going to do it live, and I'm going to, uh, to, to give you the, the changes, the things that I, th I think I'd, I should have said differently, and, and then I'm going to, to tell you the things I'm glad I did say, and then we'll, we'll see where the chips fall. And uh, so if, if you're one of those people, show up on Thursday and have your best argument there, because I'm going to compare this lens system, um, sorry, this uh, flash system, to what I use, and what other people use, and a bunch of other things. Uh, so it's going to be an interesting discussion. So come on Thursday, ready to uh, uh, defend the R1C1, or not. I mean, maybe you're you're you you won't want to. Up to you. Um, Saturday, big day, huge day. Pazoom, ten o'clock in the morning till noon. What is next? What's next in macro photography? Where does it go from here? Um, this meeting was prompted by uh, the discussion I had this weekend with Mr. Lee, uh, uh, among other things, but that got me thinking a lot about the future of macro. And I thought it was about time we talked about where macro is going. We did this about a year ago in the Pazoom, and it was a very good conversation. I was really enjoyed it, getting to hear everybody's opinion on, on what they expected to happen, and a lot of it has. We're going to do the same this Saturday. We're going to loosely base it on, on that and see where it goes. So Pazoom is a an every other weekend, uh, two-hour uh, get-together with me and my uh, supporters uh, who are um, Patreon members. It's a... Um, it's a private meeting, and uh, we, we have quite a few people show up now, but it's, a, it's like a live stream, only you get to shout back at me. And uh, we, we talk about whatever you want to talk about. Uh, we'll do demonstrations, we'll talk about insects, we'll talk about photography, we'll talk about the weather, we'll do whatever you want to do. You just come and, and, and start talking, and I join in. This weekend, then, is going to be uh, a very uh, intense one, I think, because uh, uh, there'll be lots of good ideas to consider. And following that, and half an hour after that, after you've had a chance to, uh, to get out of your dressing gown and, uh, and, uh, and you know, get all ready for the afternoon, we are going to have the first ever tangent and chamfer hour. That is a 3D modeling and printing workshop type thing. It's a live meeting with Larry Strunk and myself uh, where we are going to be talking about 3D modeling and, uh, and, and making stuff. And why am I doing this? Because this is a photography channel. Uh, well, it's because I am discovering that, that being a, a 3D modeler and builder and maker using these tools, um, it, it just takes off when you do this, when you add this to, your, to your, um, uh, your, your macro photography. All of a sudden, you can start doing things you couldn't do before because now you can make the stuff you, you didn't have before. You can... You can improve the way you do photography by building the things that you wish somebody would make 
Well, now you can make them. Case in point, and I, and I won't belabor this, but it, it, it's important enough to at least show it to you. This or should I say these are Seaford clamps. They're a um, they're very hard to find. They're very expensive. Special made. A Seaford clamp is a device that allows you to use an R1 C1 flash, which is an SB 200, a broken one, mind you. <laughs> it's not really broken. I just was trying to get it off the ring. These things, the SB200s, come on a plastic ring that I'm not going to try to pick up because I will drop it. And they only fit on in a certain way, and then they snap on with a little clamp on the back. It's very complicated. But because of what Larry has taught me, and he's probably going to teach you too, uh, I needed to create something that would allow this to be mounted on a bendy arm, because unlike the MF-12, it doesn't have a hole in the bottom. This does. This is a small section of the same ring. It fits on just like it does, just like it does on the, um, uh, the actual ring it comes with. And now you can use your SB200s in your macro cage or in the, in the studio. This Seaford clamp is the best thing I invented this weekend. And I've got four of them which go to Susan because I invented them for her. So come on Saturday and be prepared to be amazed because we are going to have so much fun figuring out what this hour is going to be like in the future. It's probably going to be more than an hour too. So. Um, Larry is going to be uh, using his genius to uh, help everybody, and I will be distracting him by talking. So uh, come. It's a, it's a Zoom meeting. To, to get in, you just need to have an invitation, and I have posted the invitation to everybody. Uh, it came out uh, earlier this week in a, um, uh, a, a Patreon release that I put out for everybody. So if you have any interest at all in exploring 3D or if you're already doing it, it doesn't matter what platform you're using, doesn't matter if you're great at it or you're terrible at it, just show up and we'll have fun and we'll figure out on Saturday what it's going to be like in the future. So this is a very much an, an exploratory thing, but I'm fired up about it and I think Larry is too. Are you, Larry? Tell us you're fired up about it. Or Hang on. Now would be a good time to insert an ad. I don't think so. I'm in the middle of a sentence. So there you go. That's it. That's the plan. Saturday we're going to invent stuff and it is going to be a blast. Let's talk about lenses. Are there any um, questions, complaints, queries? Hi. Nope, that's it. Just hi. Hi, Amy. Glad you're here. Alistair? Hi. And um, Phil, from last Thursday, asked a question at the end, and I felt so bad about it. Um, he asked if there was any way that I could get the other camera focused, and um, so there wasn't a reflection on it. Phil, I wish I'd got that earlier in the, in the meeting. I'm sorry. I hate when that happens, that uh, I don't see your note until the very end. But hopefully the video and the audio are better today. And um, I spent a good bit of time today working on the studio, getting everything fixed up to where uh, there should be fewer and fewer of those um, uh, things where you get dazzled. Um, let me see. Let's start out by talking about whoop, a question. Larry is in the house. Everybody, stand up. Give him a round of applause. His, uh, his new show starts on Saturday, so... Give him, uh, give him your um, uh, support there. Uh, it's tough doing this. Uh, I, I don't know if he's ever done this before, but doing anything with me is tough. <laughs> but uh, this will be fun. So, lenses. What, um, what are we talking about when we talk about macro lenses? Let's get that clear. I almost included some of my dioptery type stuff, like the Pexels, uh, uh, iPhone uh, macro lens. We're not talking about them. 
we're, we're, we can talk about them another time. We're not talking about super specialty stuff like this, which is a harpoon that can also be used as a camera lens. We're talking specifically about the lenses that you attach to a camera and use in the way that, that you would recognize as a, as a camera lens. You don't attach it to the front of anything. You don't uh, have to have anything else with it. You just can take this, put it on your camera and take pictures. That's what I mean by macro lens in, the, in this conversation. Now, these lenses come in all kinds of different arrangements, but there are a few things that they all have in common that makes them a macro lens. Now, to give you some idea of the, of the variety that's available, I showed you at the beginning, there are, there are such things as super wide angle macro lenses, a layer invention, uh, incredibly creative, fun to use. On the other end of that spectrum, there are telephoto macro lenses that allow you to, to get enormous reach uh, while also getting uh, detail and magnification. Then there are cinematic macro lenses that have special features that overcome some of the problems we see with other macro lenses so that you can shoot video with them. Then there are cheap macro lenses. Yeah, we'll just uh, leave that right there you now it's very, very um, a very nice thing if if you're uh, if you don't have uh, the funds to buy a macro lens a real ma i mean this is a real macro lens it actually takes decent pictures but it's incredibly inexpensive under a hundred dollars and uh, it actually performs n not bad at all uh, for a, uh, a very compact externally focusing macro lens um, this is from TT Artisan, actually. I love this thing. It's 40 millimeters, short. And then there are ultra specialty lenses, but they're still macro lenses. Things like the wonderful 25 millimeter uh, um, f2.8, two and a half to five times magnification lens. This is really pushing the definition of a macro lens, in my opinion, uh, but it, it's included here. Um, Obviously, I'm a Nikon shooter, so when it comes to, to the standard uh, basic uh, macro lenses, uh, I'll be talking about the ones that uh, are on, in my ecosystem. Um, Canon have theirs, Sony have theirs, and uh, most of what I'm going to be talking about applies to all. So what are the, the obvious differences in a macro lens? Well, let's, let's look at this, uh, this beautiful um, this was the first macro lens I bought, the first real one. It's the 85 millimeter. It's a D lens uh, for um, Nikon. It's an autofocus with um, uh, with very good vibration control. Um, fantastic lens. Uh, it's the first true full feature macro lens that I bought, and uh, it's served me very well. It has a very close minimum focus distance because. What a macro lens is in some respects, and one way to think about it is if you took the guts of an, a lens and turned them around inside, you'd have a macro lens, sort of. You know how your, your, your regular uh, 50 millimeter lens, it, it takes things that are far away and it brings them a little bit closer. Uh, it allows you to get a picture of things that uh, are, are, are a good distance from you. A macro lens does the opposite. It flips that around. It allows you to get very close. My phone is making bonging noises. Oh, it's a question. Do we need to be Patreon to attend Tangent and Chamfer? No, you do not. You just need to... You, no, you do not. Just get the invitation. The invitation is over on Discord. It's on... Patreon, it's on the Walls app. Uh, so you just, uh, no, just get the uh, invitation and show up and you're, and you're part of it. No, it's for everybody. Okay. Um, so as I was saying, I can't remember what I was saying, something about the lens. It allows you to focus close 
And if you try to do that with a regular uh, lens, you'll, you'll see you can't. You can't focus close. It, the, the ability to focus close is because the, the way the lens is processing the light that's coming through is flipped around. And what you, what you need to do to get more magnification is extend the distance to your sensor as opposed to shorten the distance to your sensor uh, as you would uh, with a, uh, a telephoto lens. So regular lenses have a minimum focus distance that is not close enough for you to see the kind of detail that you want to see. A macro lens flips that around gives you a shorter minimum focus distance so you can get close up and see the details. Remember, macro photography is recording details that you otherwise can't see with, with your eye, usually. Magnification. Regular lenses typically offer magnification, magnification on the order of what? Two to, uh, I mean, one to, to 10, one to 12, something like that, 0.15. So not much magnification at all. Macro lenses generally offer magnifications anywhere from 1 to 2 to 2 to 1. Um, and uh, most being right around 1 to 1. Interesting conversation with Mr. Lee about that. But uh, yeah, macro lenses are designed so that uh, you get that magnification so you can capture the, those small details. Reproduction ratio, uh, that, that is the one-to-one the, the -one that we always talk about. That's another way of describing uh, magnification. But you'll hear macro lenses described as one-to-one -one or two-to-one. That's what they're talking about. And um, the, the optical quality of macro lenses, and now this is a general blanket statement, but it's, it's got a, a, a grain of truth in it are generally speaking optically more uh, carefully put together than the regular camera lenses. That is because a lot of the, uh, the, a lot of the things that will plague macro photography where we're looking for high contrast and fine detail are things that wouldn't really be noticed that much with a regular lens. Chromatic aberration, flat field, uh, all kinds of geometric abnormalities, things that are hard to notice on a regular lens when you're shoot, take, taking pictures of landscapes and people, suddenly become really, really important with a macro lens. And they have to be corrected. They have to be taken care of. And the result is macro lenses often are the pinnacle of a lens company's offerings. It's the best lens they have because they have had to work so diligently to take care of all of the, the, the things that will result in a, a, a poor macro shot. And the result is a very well corrected lens, very well put together lens. Um, and most good macro lenses are corrected for a flat field. Uh, this was another lens that I didn't include was, was my reversed in larger lenses a great example of what a flat field lens should be. Uh, most lenses don't even bother about that, um, at least certainly the, the consumer level ones. The, the um, working distance of a macro lens depends on its focal length, of course, but uh, they're, go they're going to be short. You can use uh, uh, most macro lenses uh, that aren't specialty lenses as regular camera lenses. This is an 85 millimeter lens. It's a good portrait lens as well as a macro lens. Just because it can focus close, it doesn't mean you have to focus close. Um, the way to think about a good macro lens is it's a close up lens that does everything else that a lens is supposed to do at that focal length. Um, and that's not true with all lenses. There are some specialty lenses, again, like the, the Leo that we talked about last week, that you can't focus to infinity. Uh, you, in fact, you can't focus outside of a, a few millimeters, either side of 40 millimeters. It's just very limited. Uh, and that is the case with a lot of these other specialty lenses that we're not including. Depth of field is a function of 
your your magnification and how close you are to your subject but the the general rule of thumb is that the with a macro lens your depth of field is going to be very very shallow you just you know you know it is you can still use i mean your macro lens if you're using it as a portrait lens a, a 90 millimeter lens say uh, is going to have exactly the same depth of field if you're using it to photograph a person in the studio as any other 90 millimeter lens. It's just when you get close in there and photograph one of their nostrils, yeah, you've got shallow depth of field. The closer you get, the shallower it gets. Um, so just keep that in mind that uh, by and large, they are for close-up photography, but can be used for, for uh, just about anything else uh, with, with exception. Okay, so let, let's talk about um, what exactly is in a macro lens that makes it different than uh, a regular lens. What are, the, what are the physical elements in there? Well, there are quite a lot of them, and some of these things you'll find also in other lenses. I mean, that these are not entirely unique to macro lenses. It's just commonly you'll see them. Um, let me see. I've got a list of the things that uh, uh, that that I thought were most important. Probably the uh, one of the first things that comes to mind is floating elements, where you have len uh, lens elements or groups of lens elements that move independently of the rest of the assembly. In other words, there are groups of lenses in 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 this macro lens that will move separately. I think I'm getting, um, uh, hmm. Oh, this Alistair saying we've got some new people, um, and that's fantastic. Um, uh, mm, nope, they are new names to me. Clayton, welcome. Red Eyed Loon, welcome. I'm sorry, I, I didn't realize uh, uh, that, uh, uh, that you were in there. New folks, uh, we welcome warmly because, uh, yeah, that's what this is all about is, is uh, getting, getting the word out to as many people as, uh, as we can. So, so welcome. Hope you enjoy it. Today we're talking about macro lenses, but uh, who knows from one day to the next what I'm going to be talking about. But this is, uh, this is just one of the things we do on this channel. Plenty of videos, about 600 of them. You, if you want to go look at them, you can. But today we're, we're just, uh, we're taking a break from our video month to talk about lenses and, um, and just uh, do something for the, uh, for the newcomers. So if you guys are, are new to macro, welcome. If you're just new to the channel, welcome to us too. So uh, where was I? Talking about uh, macro lenses and what's special in, in the insides of them. Now, Floating elements are found in a lot of different lenses, but you're almost always going to find the high-end macro lenses have this. And it's part of the way that they can overcome aberrations. And uh, it's actually also uh, uh, one of the, the features that, that help um, uh, reduce the effect of uh, diffraction a little bit. It has something of an impact. Apochromatic elements uh, are often seen in the highest end uh, macro lenses. Apochromatic simply means that, just like with microscope objectives, the light is corrected for all of the wavelengths of, of color. That was said so poorly that I'm going to say it again. When light is, uh, uh, is directed through your macro lens, if it is not corrected for the different wavelengths of light, they will spread out. And when they spread out, they cause fringing of color on either side of what would have been a sharp line. So at the areas of, of high um, contrast, dark against light, the, the, light the, the light does not form a line between the dark and the light. It forms a, a more of a zone where there is um, color that is spreading out from the uh, from the um, uh, defocused nature of the of, of the lens, so apochromatic elements are designed to focus the wavelengths of light of different colors differently, so that they all arrive at the same place 
at the same time and form a sharp line. That was even worse than the way I described it the first time. But most of the of the lenses that that you see at the at the lower end of the spectrum will have uh, an acromat uh, type uh, design where the reds and the blues are aligned, but the middle part of the spectrum is not. An apochromatic lens also takes care of that, so it's a fully corrected lens. It involves additional glass elements, oftentimes a, a doublet or a, a triplet of lenses that are actually glued together in the middle as a floating element that is used to, to correct the, the, uh, the light so that all of the colors arrive at the same time and you don't get fringing because that's also going to cause softening. Low dispersion, you'll, you'll hear lenses uh, uh, talk about having LD or, or ELD, extra low dispersion elements. These, these are just kinds of glass that uh, spread the light out less so that it can be more controlled. It's, it, it's kind of complicated, but it's a way to reduce chromatic aberrations again. And it also makes your image a little bit sharper. And uh, it's um, a, a color accuracy thing. So oftentimes you'll see uh, elements, low dispersion elements that are also uh, alongside aspherical elements, which are lenses that are not formed as part of a, a sphere, but they have an odd shape to them, kind of like a, an oval shape before they're made in. It's, forget about it. I'm not going to try to describe it. It's like describing a spiral staircase with your hands tied. Uh, I, I'd need to draw it to, to get my point across. But aspherical elements are not completely round. The result is they bend light of different frequencies at a different uh, degree so that it gives you sharpness and clarity and better definition. They're hard to make. They're complicated to design. And they jack the cost of the lens up quite a bit. Um, most good macro lenses have an internal focusing system. Not all. This is not an internal focusing system right here. This is a good example of what external focusing looks like. It tends to make focus breathing worse. Uh, there's a lot of things about it. I'll talk about it specifically in a, in a few minutes. Well, no, I'll talk about it now while we're here. The, um, uh, the, the internal focusing keeps all of the moving elements inside the barrel so the lens doesn't change shape. Why I think this is so important in macro lenses particularly is that when you have an internally focusing lens like the, the Tamron that you can focus from one end to the other. This is the 90 millimeter, uh, one of the best affordable macro lenses in the world in my opinion. Because all of the focusing mechanism is happening within the barrel, this lens can be effectively weather sealed. They, it's not, not to say that they all are, but when you have an internally focusing lens, you are, it's easier to do that, to seal it against weather. And uh, that's important if you're out in all conditions like we are. Um, and uh, that's just one of the things uh, that, that uh, is helpful. Internally focusing lenses tend not to have as much focus breathing, though they, they still have plenty. Um, and uh, they're, they're more expensive because they're more mechanically complicated, but they do tend to have sh uh, faster and more accurate um, autofocus if you use autofocus. So there are definitely advantages uh, and not many disadvantages to having an internally focusing lens. I don't think there are very many, well, no. I'm trying to think if I have any other. This Nikon 55 is a gorgeous micro Nikkor 55 millimeter macro lens, totally a fully manual, but it has, um, it has external focusing, but it's, it's one that I love. Uh, I mean, it's a beautiful lens, sharp, sharp, sharp. Um, the aperture design on a macro lens tends to be more carefully thought out. Uh, oftentimes the, the blades will be rounded 
and there'll be more of them. The reason for that, or one of the reasons for that, is it gives better control over, um, over uh, diffraction, which is important, again, at macro level because you're seeing so much detail. I can't find the, the squeezy buttons to get this off. Well, I'll show it to you on another lens. Oh, sorry about that. I should have... Oh, dearie me. There. That makes me nervous picking that up. The, um, uh, the more blades with rounded edges tend to limit diffraction. And it's one of the few things that you can do to actually lessen the impact of diffraction, but it also makes the out-of-focus areas much prettier. Um, the, the, the rounder and, and more shapely the, the edge of your, uh, of your uh, diaphragm, the nicer the, the bokeh will be. And Sony makes lenses that, that really pay attention to that. Um, I think that the, the 90 millimeter G lens is, has got lovely bokeh. Um, most of these lenses will have a limiter uh, that allows your autofocus, if you're using it, to work within a narrower range so that it isn't hunting throughout the entire depth of focus to find your focal point. You can say, I just want you to focus within you know, three feet and that speeds up the process. So you won't find that on any other lens that I'm aware of other than, uh, other than the macro lens. Oh, actually, no, some telephoto lenses have it at the other end of the spectrum. Um, these lenses, just like any other good lens, will have lens coatings to reduce glare and ghosting, that type of thing. Uh, again, just to get that little bit of extra quality, they'll use these multi-nano coating things. Honestly, um, yeah, they, you can't live without them, but I don't know much about them. <laughs> I, I know that uh, I watched a video uh, where they were putting them on lenses and... Uh, it looked like a very complicated procedure, but the result is it doesn't it doesn't give you near as much flare uh, when you're out in the in the sun. So worth getting. Um, let me see. Uh, a lot of these lenses, the ones especially that focus externally, will have something else that you won't see on a regular lens, and that is a, a magnification scale. Yeah, so you can just look at the barrel of the lens and, and get an idea of how magnified you are. This is the Leo, a 25 uh, millimeter. Um, wonderful lens, uh, very interesting, very challenging to use. Not really a great handheld lens for me, but uh, it's nice to have that. Um, uh, here's, a, here's another one that offers the same thing. Even fancier, gives it to you in feet and um, where are we? Gives it to you in feet and uh, meters. Very nice. This is a cine lens. This is made for uh, video. It's internally focusing. And uh, why this is different, and, and this has a lot of different things in it, uh, it is designed to shoot video. So you have a, a, a clickless aperture. So it will open and close the diaphragm smoothly and over a fairly large throw so that you can gradually change your depth of field and your light without uh, having to clip through it. Same with the focus. It has a large focus ring that moves in internally, the, the elements do, and it, let me see if I can, yeah, it allows you to get a huge throw. It's almost two thirds of the way around the, the lens body so that you've got lots of room to make fine adjustments in the focus in real time. So there's a lot about this lens that makes it different than a, a regular camera lens and quite unique. And uh, I'll be going into that in some detail when we do the review. Um, the autofocus mechanisms on macro lenses in my experience especially with the high-end Nikon lenses uh, are, are better uh, they they tend to end up getting the the, the quiet fast uh, autofocus motors not the 200 this has a washing machine motor in it it's the sharpest lens 
I own, I think, but um, it has the clunkiest autofocus. It makes a lot of noise and is very slow, but that's okay. It's 30 years old. Uh, it, they, they hadn't perfected it. So th those are the things that are uh, inside one of these that makes them different than, than a regular lens. Um, let me just um, give you a, the, the names of a couple of, of uh, standout macro lenses that, that would e exemplify everything I just said. Now, the newest Nikon, the MC105, this is one of the nicest macro lenses I've ever used. It is bright, it is sharp, it has gorgeous bokeh, it uh, focuses fast, it's accurate. It's just really not there's nothing bad about it it's it's even lightweight for the size of it it's absolutely gorgeous that's one of the best lenses in the world right now for macro this is another one another nikon uh, it's the 200 millimeter f4 it's not easy to use it's heavy it's uh clunky it's noisy uh, it doesn't have a good autofocus but it is sharp 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 and it gives you the reach that a 200 millimeter lens can give you that means you can get your maximum magnification one-to-one -one with this lens at a far enough reach from your subject that you're not going to scare it off nearly as often that is why you would want to to look at a longer focal length lens now the reason I, I wanted to talk about focal length, I'm going to get back to the list of lenses in just a second, but the reason I wanted to talk about it was Mr. Lee said something very interesting this weekend. I brought up the question of, of uh, the 200 millimeter um, F, you know, 2.8 or thereabouts pro lens that is currently missing uh, in the world of macro. There isn't anybody making one. Irex makes... 150 millimeter lens and uh, it's I haven't been able to get one uh, to, to try out but I hear that they're, they're, they're okay but there are pros out there who really want a 200 millimeter uh, f 2.8 or f4 uh, macro lens that is updated that has a great autofocus great coatings all the right elements and performs like the MC but 105 well, I posed the question to Mr. Lee, is, is this something that, that you guys would plan on making? Is this something that you want to make? And he basically said, no, don't think so. <laughs> I said I was going to set Robert on him uh, because uh, Robert's just beside himself about this, about not being able to get a modern 200 millimeter lens. But Mr. Lee said that... Uh, there isn't much market for it and uh, and that really surprised me because almost every macro photographer that I talk to will say will list first and foremost as the lens that they don't have that they wish they had was a good long uh, uh, macro lens with autofocus and all the bells and whistles um, so it's probably a, a selection thing that I'm just talking to the wrong people. <laughs> I'm just talking to macro photographers and mostly pro macro photographers. So uh, that's a small group of people. But the, by and large, Mr. Lee said 100 millimeters. That's what everybody wants. And that has been what everybody has been getting. I mean, the uh, most, most macro lenses are in that 90 to 105 uh, uh, millimeter uh, range. So getting back to, to the list, hardly surprisingly, most of these lenses are in that, that ballpark. So there are a couple of those Nikons. I would add to it the previous, the, the uh, 105 that came before the MC, but after this 105. Um, I, I don't have one, but it's uh, the, the f2.8 the classic uh, macro lens, gorgeous. Uh, very nice. Uh, don't currently have one. Um, Tamron. Tamron gets a, a nod. When I asked Mr. Lee, what is your favorite lens, whether 
you know, you guys made it or not, what's your favorite lens to use as a macro photographer? Because he is a macro photographer. He said the Tamron. How about that? Of course, he also invented this. He, he designed this when he was at, at uh, Tamron. <laughs> so, yeah, not a coincidence, I'm sure. But uh, right, so a lot of people who've used this lens think it is right up there with uh, the, the, the other fantastic ones, like the Sony FE90 is another one. It's a f2.8 uh, macro G, the OSS lens. Gorgeous. And uh, it's, it really is sharp, and it's, it's known for its uh, sharpness. Zeiss makes the, the Milvus um, 100 millimeter, which is uh, an f2 lens. Not exactly sure why you need f2. I mean, do you ever use your macro lenses wide open? I, I don't. Um, in the field, I use them at f8, and in the studio, I use them at f5.6 or thereabouts. Um, Canon. Uh, makes several lenses. They have a 160 millimeter lens as well as uh, the 65 MPE, which they no longer make. But if you're into the super magnification stuff, that's a lens to think about getting. Though honestly, I would choose this over the MPE 65. I really would. And I, I can't wait. Uh, uh, my friend Rick is uh, thinking about buying one of these. And if he does, uh, I'll be very interested to hear how he compares it to the to the 65. So that's a few of the good ones. But, you know, every company that the um, uh, Olympus company has um, has that uh, um, micro four thirds system, the OM system. They've got a lovely macro lens, really, really sharp. It's it's a, a one to two, I believe. Uh, but, you know, it's on a much smaller sensor. So it's, uh, it's really nice. That's the system that has in-body uh, stacking. Very cool. Um, so what is it? We've got time. Good. Um, my phone's been dinging off. Let me see if there's any questions before I get to the next thing. Um, let me see. Uh, Canonless. What a good name. Greetings. Um, you're new to photography. Can I explain bellows? Are there rules to what lenses and adapters can be used? Do they serve the same purpose as a macro? No, no. Uh, a bellows is a, is a fancy way of um, describing empty space. That's what a bellows is. It's an adjustable tube with nothing in it. There are no glass elements. There is no lens. It serves one purpose, and one purpose, well mostly one purpose only, and that is to move the lens away from the sensor of your camera or the film, whatever you're using. That is how you in, get a, uh, your magnification, is by moving the, the lens away from the, the sensor. That will allow the image to spread out more, and it'll give you more uh, 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 enlargement. So you use bellows with the lens that you already have to get more magnification. Now, not all lenses work well with bellows. Sometimes moving the lens away from the sensor and spreading the light out can result in aberrations or uh, a chromatic aberration or geometric problems. It can, it can create problems with your images uh, that are not uh, something that you want to see. Also, as you move away from the, the uh, sensor, the aperture, the hole in the lens, the camera sees it getting smaller and smaller. And in photography, it's what the camera sees that counts. So if you're shooting with a, a, a fairly wide open um, aperture, which is when you will not have diffraction, which is diffraction is what softens your pictures. So if you're shooting with your aperture like this open, which is gigantic, and then you move the, the lens away from the sensor, it's getting smaller, isn't it? The, the hole is getting smaller. That is what the camera sees. So your aperture is going from f4 to f24 to f64 as you get further and further away. It's as if 
you were just closing down. Oh, I picked one that won't do it. Hang on. I've got to change the doodad. There we go. It's, uh, it's as if, as you move the lens away from the camera, that you're doing this. And you're closing the aperture down, even though uh, you are physically moving it, but you're not touching the aperture. The result is the camera sees it smaller and smaller. Diffraction gets worse and worse. It's called the effective aperture, and it's as important as the actual nominal aperture. So that bellows aren't the 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 uh, be all end all uh, it is a way to magnify it's a way to take lenses that otherwise might be um, not particularly helpful for macro and turn them into fantastic lenses 50 millimeter camera lenses most of them the basic pancake lens turn it around backwards and put it on your bellows at 100 millimeters and you have got a killer sharp macro lens the hundred dollar um, Nikkor 50 millimeter f 1.8 d is a great example of a cheap camera lens that is superb on bellows in reverse other lenses that are great are uh, in larger lenses uh, that are used for um, uh, for enlarging st uh, uh, negatives to, to make photographs those things turned around backwards on the bellows are fantastic i have got multiple videos about the bellows how to use it the lenses to use everything about it uh, on on my channel just go to to the video part and search for bellows or go to my website and and type in bellows there's all kinds of articles there and you and you'll find them but good question thank you yeah anytime you have a question i stop what i'm doing to, to answer questions that's that's what i'm here for so uh yeah, please don't hesitate to ask. 64 people tonight. That's a bit of a record for, for January, isn't it? I think it is. You see what I did the other day? Oh, where is it? It's on the other side. My B. I accidentally printed it in black and white. And I absolutely love it. It's better than the green version up there. Yeah, it was an accident but it just looks fantastic in silver. Um, let, let me see. What is it that makes these lenses, the, the macro lenses, the good ones, so darn sharp? Because that they are. That's what, that's what you'll notice first about a high-quality macro lens. It's because they use the, the best uh, lens glass it's they, they they pick the elements that are, that are the the highest quality to to make these lenses because they have to because you can't get away with anything when you're focusing on such small detail uh, the slightest the slightest problems with glass quality uh, will result in major issues with the the um, uh, resulting photograph um and it's just because you're when you magnify the subject, you're also magnifying the uh, the the defects uh, in the workmanship or the uh, or the material. Uh, aperture design we already talked about. Uh, chromatic aberration correction. You, a lot of people don't think about the the the, the aberrations that you see in color um, uh, colors represented in your photographs. As, as having anything to do with sharpness, but of course they do. If you have chromatic aberration and you are causing the, the uh, color to spread out into its spectrum a little bit, and you're having uh, purple and green fringing, then you're also spreading out the sharpness of the, of the image. The, the contrast is being diluted by that, by that spreading of the color. So yeah, uh, chromatic aberration does soften the image just like diffraction does, so it needs to be corrected. Coatings we talked about, internal focusing we talked about. Okay, uh, let me see. Oh, that beeping was money coming in. A super chat, which means there must be a question. Diane, thank you so much. Welcome. Um, Oh, yeah, yeah, right. Macro Everything Around Me had a question as well. 
you you wanted to know um, uh, the music, where to get the music for your um, a video. Go to the Walls app and watch the video that will be on the uh, competition page. It is, it is not by me, though I am in it. <laughs> it is by Patrick, and it is worth going over there and looking at. It's funny and good. Uh, Patrick went to a lot of trouble to, uh, uh, to, to figure everything out about the music for your videos. Go there. I'm not going to repeat what he says in that, in that video, but it's entertaining enough that you want to go there anyway. The Walls app, www walls-app.com yep go to competition when you open it up the video's right there click on it and uh, be impressed he did a great job great job with that um, okay Clayton uh, Von Kluge uh, do you use extensions no this is all my my natural hair you <laughs> extension cubes yes um, I I do I I use pretty much everything you can use to take macro photographs. Extension tubes are the only way I, uh, well, one of the only ways I use uh, microscope objectives is with extension tubes and, and a relay lens. You're probably talking about, do I use them with just a regular lens? Absolutely. Mostly to teach because I have quite a few macro lenses. I don't need to do that. But uh, yeah, uh, there are many, many ways to use extension tubes to, uh, uh, to turn a regular lens into a, a, a high power macro lens. Again, I have videos on top of videos about using extensions. So uh, check out the, the back catalog of, of videos or go to my website and search for extension tubes and you'll, you'll see it. Much the same answer is with the bellows only fixed okay uh, moving on uh, so that ought to be good canon list if you have any other questions about it you can catch me uh, uh, over at discord or um, if you're in patreon you can catch me at the weekend and we'll we'll talk about it more um, let me see thank you diane appreciate it four bucks way to go and um I uh, just wanted to say that I'm learning a lot and ready to learn more. Well, you're in the right place, Diane, because we, we talk a lot about macro here and uh, we do have fun, though. Uh, so, uh, yeah, you're, you're, you're in the right place. If you want to, to learn, I'll, I'll teach you everything I know about it, uh, but it'll take a while. Not because, not because I know a lot, but because I, I can't seem to stay on point. Um, lens construction and build quality. Um, is one of the other uh, ways that um, uh, these lenses take sharp pictures. They are really built like tanks. Even this cheap lens, and it is really a, a cheap macro lens, is heavier by, uh, it's 100% heavier than any lens this size that I've ever picked up. It's a brick. Uh, so most most all of these lenses are built very solidly because, again, they need to be. They're protecting floating elements and uh, they're expensive. Uh, and they, most of them also have autofocus. Autofocus, good autofocus, will help uh, give you sharp pictures. If you have clunky autofocus, it doesn't. Uh, but... Um, it, it's most most macro photographers don't rely on autofocus, but some of us use it. I use it to get in the ballpark. The obvious one is, of course, optical stabilization, the, the anti-vibration system that virtually all modern uh, macro lenses have, except the the uh, the lenses from Leowa, which don't use it. Though that is going to change, by the way. Uh, you have to watch the interview with Mr. Lee, but uh, there are some interesting things coming to Leowa. But most of these lenses have a vibration control system. Some of them will give you three, even four stops of stabilization, meaning you can, you can hold the camera at four stops uh, lower light and still not get shake because of the, the, the control it gives you. Um, and uh, 
you never want to rely on it. You never want to rely solely on the, the lens's anti-vibration, but it does help. If you're doing everything to stabilize your camera, using a tripod, using a monopod, bracing the camera against your head or your, your body or a tree, then the, the, the autofocus, I uh, beg your pardon, the vibration control, though you wouldn't be using it on a tripod per se, uh, will help. It will add to the sharpness. But if you're just going to be shaking the camera around, it's not, it doesn't help as much as, as you would think. So it, 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 it helps, but um, uh, it's, it, it, it helps your technique, but your technique still has to be there. Um, we talked about dis distortion and, and aberration control. Macro lenses often have a, a fairly narrow sweet spot. And in that sweet spot, they can be some of the sharpest lenses you'll ever see. Every single one of these lenses has a sweet spot uh, where the aperture is just the right size that I, it, it gives me minimum uh, distortion on the low end or on the, the wide open end and minimal diffraction on the closed end. That, that's what we mean by sweet spot. I'm going to pause just long enough to explain this for those of you that are new. If a lens has too big an aperture, as the aperture gets bigger and bigger and bigger, as it gets all the way up to uh, 2.8 in this, in this lens case, oh, it's locked. Um, what that does is it introduces uh, chromatic aberration and geometric aberration and, and changes in the flatness of the image. So you get the image quality gets worse when you get really wide open like this. Now, we're talking about a specific lens. In this case, this lens gets worse at 2.8. When I get it down to about 5.6, it gets really, really sharp and the aberration goes away, but there's no diffraction. As you go even smaller, which usually means more depth of field and a sharper image, that's when it starts to, to reveal diffraction because your aperture is getting too small. So this lens has a sweet spot somewhere between 5.6 and 8. Uh, which is a, a fairly closed aperture for a sweet spot. But there you go. That's the way it is. So every lens you have has got a best a best F number to shoot at. And uh, the trick is finding it and remembering it. Okay, there was another ding. Question from Clayton. Alan, do you shoot uh, more macro outdoors or indoors? I shoot... If you were to count the number of indi individual frames that I shoot, I shoot a thousand times more indoors because a single photograph may be a thousand images before it's finished. Uh, but I would say time-wise, I spend four times as much time taking pictures in the studio as I do outdoors. I wish it were different. I would gladly do it the other way around and spend four times as much time outdoors but I can, I can do other things like run the channel and make videos when I'm here in the studio and taking pictures at the same time. I can't do that as much when I'm out in nature. But yeah, uh, I, am, I consider myself a studio macro photographer, mostly. Though saying it out loud, it makes me want to get outside. I was going to talk about macro um, uh, lens cost but I'm not going to because, uh, yep, we're out of time. It's nine o'clock. What happens with the time when I do this? It suddenly starts to speed up. Um, I really wanted to talk about it too. Well, we, we will. Um, there, there are some good points that uh, uh, explain the cost. Uh, Thursday, uh, we're going to get into the R1C1 and uh, the creative lighting system and the whole, uh, the whole uh, flash and Nikon thing. Uh, that's going to be our conversation. Don't miss it. And uh, if you're not a member of Patreon, um, now would be a probably a good time in your life to decide to, to support someone, and that someone should be me, because uh, we, we've got a Pazoom coming up this weekend, which is kind of like a, a Boy Scouts jamboree, only there are no Boy Scouts or Poison Ivy. 
It's just me and you sitting around talking about macro, which is what we do. So welcome to, to my, my new uh, visitors. I do hope you come back and, uh, and visit again. We do this twice a week. And then there's videos coming out all the time. The, the Mr. Lee video, I talked to the owner of, um, of Leowa Lenses, uh, uh, Venus Optics, over uh, in uh, Hong Kong this weekend. That video is coming out shortly. Uh, I've got um, oh, I, so many things coming out, I can't even keep them all straight. So uh, this weekend is going to be a big one. If you're even remotely interested in 3D modeling and printing, please come to the uh, Tangent and Chamfer show. What do you think of my, um, uh, my cover for that, my artwork? You know that's a, a Tangent and a Chamfer all in one picture. I made it myself. Not impressed, are you? Okay, well, come on Saturday and be impressed by Larry. Thank you, everybody, for coming. And, uh, yeah, it's great to see so many people um, uh, coming by. Uh, one of these days, um, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll have to move to the, what do you call it, the, the Madison Square Gardens. Is that, is that a, a thing? A big hall of some kind? Yeah, we'll move there and do the, the program. Until then, everybody, have a good week. See you on Thursday, I hope. And uh, thanks for coming. Welcome to the new folks. Let's do this again. I want to read my messages, uh, but I'll, uh, I'll sign off so that you guys can uh, not have to watch me read. See you later.